really what it is is you want to put as much weight as you can on there to, to just press it up. If you're doing like a bench press or squats or whatnot, you want to make sure that you're, you got as much weight on there as you can to beat the, the, the last time that you did your max. So you want to max out and there's all this tons of weight on it. And um, if you were lucky enough, to, you would have a, a friend who would help spot you. But then there are those times when, because we're in high school, because we're boys, we're not men yet, because we're boys, we're gonna play practical jokes on one another. And if you're doing your max, you're gonna have a couple of guys pressing down on the bar. <laughs> so you're, you're really feeling that weight. Um, and in the same way, it reminds me of today. Uh, today is such a weighty topic because we're talking about the crucifixion. We're talking about the crucifixion of Christ. And it's, a, it's such a weighty topic. And throughout this whole sermon, we're going to get an explanation of why the crucifixion, why a cross. We're going to talk about Jesus' punishment. We're going to talk about Jesus being mocked and crucified and what we have to do with that. And we're going to talk about Jesus' death and our connection with it. And we're going to talk about why Jesus had to die. And of course, next week we're going to get into the resurrection. And I am looking forward to that. But today, like a good piece of steak, I want to be able to get all the juice, all the meat out of it that we possibly can with the limited time that we have. So with that, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Your word is truth. And help me to, to deliver your word in grace and love. In the name of Jesus, amen. So the first thing we want to do is we want to explain the crucifixion. And a lot of this, part of this uh, and the explanation is to, uh, to really let you know what a person would go through when they were crucified. It was, part of this is uh, from notes from a place called All About Jesus Christ. But it was a Roman type of execution. The Romans would use this to execute people. It's a very special means of torture. It's a very special means of, of death. The crucifixion sometimes began with a scourging or a flogging of the victim's back. And by the time they got done with whipping somebody, especially on the back and the backs of their legs, there's almost no skin left. It's like hamburger meat. The Romans used a whip called a flagrum, which consisted of small pieces of bone and metal mixed in, attached to the leather strands. So probably according to Jewish law, Jesus more than likely endured at least 40 lashes. The skin was ripped from the back, exposing a bloody mass of tissue and bone. An extreme loss of blood occurred. And sometimes that process would cause death or at least somebody would pass out. And they wouldn't even get to the cross. In addition to that, Jesus faced severe beatings, torment, they teased him, they spit on him, they pulled his beard, they ripped a piece of it out. I mean, the Bible even talks about that he was unrecognizable. We did not. We saw him, we looked upon his visage, but he was not recognizable. On top of that, they went out into the surrounding area Got the thorns, the thorns. I've been to Israel. I've seen the thorns that they used. They could be anywhere from, I don't know, an inch, three and a half inches, sometimes a little bit longer, but they are like little stakes to pierce in. And when you have that type of pressure that is forced on your head, then you have the trickles of blood that come down and then when you get blood in your eye, it's almost impossible to see. But after all of that, the victim now has to carry the crossbar. 
as far as it goes across the horizontal line. He has to carry it, and it's probably going to be weighing close to 100 pounds. So, which is why, more than likely, Jesus received help, as the scripture says, to carry that. Um, it's been reported that <clears throat> it's possible that Jesus had to carry that crossbar about the length of two football fields. To get the picture, he's already been taken away, which is humiliating. By not, he was sold for 30 pieces of silver. By someone who should have been a friend. He's questioned. He's gentle. They made fun of him. They pull his beard. They beat him. And the scripture says the whole time that he came here to die. He came here to seek and save that which was lost. You and I. His back is hamburger. So how in the world is he carrying a crossbar on him? How do you do that that's weighing close to 100 pounds? How in the world do you do that? I mean, not just Jesus, but anybody who is going to be killed that way. How in the world do you do that while your flesh, back and front, is macerated? How do you do that? The sun is beating down. There's insects and flies. People are spitting on you as you're walking. How do you do that? Now the victim arrives at the execution site. And he's there. And they've got to get him up there. So, so what they do is they, they've got to have some type of glue that's going to hold him. The glue that they chose, you're right, the spikes, metal spikes. About seven inches long, probably about three-eighths of an inch in diameter, were driven into the wrist. Because if they would have been driven into the hands, would have broken bones, which would have violated the prophetic scripture. So what they did was they put it right there, right in between that bone, those two bones. And they were to make sure that it's going to hold them. You're going to hold them down. See? 1 Corinthians 1.18 says that the cross... I'll open it up right now. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. We're watching, we're listening to the power of God being literally worked out. And these Roman soldiers have no idea that they are fulfilling scripture so that a wicked, vile human being like me can get their sins forgiven. So he's nailed in and at this point, everything is strained. They put him up, and can you imagine the weight just jolting his whole body as he comes down like that, and the ripping and tearing of skin? And the position of the nail body Nailed body held to the victim's rib cage and in a fixed position, it made it difficult to exhale or to take a breath either way. Because you're literally, I don't know if you've ever seen or watched somebody die, but they go into that death breath. That <laughs> this is what Jesus is doing. If you could picture his feet are put together and he's literally he's pushing himself up to breathe and lifting up his chest to breathe and having to come back down again, which is causing even more weight on his shoulders that are already taxed. 
He's already suffered the scourging, the beatings, the whole walk. At this point, he's extremely weak and dehydrated. <clears throat> Blood is gushing from him. So you're going to get cramps, contractions, in and out of consciousness. And yet, the Bible declares that it was his joy to go to the cross for us. Because he knew that one day we would become his kids, his children. But it's not the nails, it's not the scourging, it's not the beating. It's what you have to worry about if you're going to be crucified, you have to be worried about the suffocation. We're talking about the breaths that are taken. And there comes a point where you're too tired and you can't lift your body up and your lungs are going to fill up blood. And it becomes an increasingly huge strain on the heart. And to the heart is beating faster so it can keep up with the body. fluid that builds up in the lungs under the stress of hypoxia. The heart can't do it anymore and it's going to give up. One of the theories states is that Jesus died of a cardiac rupture. However he died, we know that he did die and he died for you and I. He sustained torture and he sustained a walk that was unbearable and he sustained a time on the cross that was immeasurable in pain and that's just the physical part and we're going to get into later the wrath of God he became sin for us I'm in ministry, and throughout my time of ministry, anybody that is in ministry, whether you're paid or not, if you've been in some type of Christian leadership, you know what I'm talking about. During your time of ministry, you're going to endure great times, joy, wonderfulness. You're also going to endure pain, a certain amount of suffering thoughts of, I'm going to throw in the towel. I've just had it. I'm done. It's too hard. Jesus spent those three years in ministry dealing with knuckleheads that were all around him, his disciples, trying to figure things out. Trying to figure out who's going to be first in the kingdom. Enduring uh, Judas backstabbing him, he's already endured what we would consider suffering. But he came here for a purpose. He came here to die for the sins of the world. I don't understand after, when we're done with this message here, I am still not going to understand how a person can come, in quotes, come to Christ and not follow Jesus. Don't get it after the biblical record of the cross and what the cross is supposed to do to the heart. You're a new creation in Christ. Yet we have tons of people in the United States that say, I'll take Christ at my own pace. Don't get it after reading the biblical record of the cross. We're not talking perfection, but what in the world is the direction? Jesus said, 
pick up your cross and follow me. Put your hands to the plow. Don't look back, because if you look back, you're not worthy of being my disciple. I see here with the cross every indication, every motivation to live for Christ. And when I do sin, run to him so I can get cleaned up because I know how weak I can be. I know the power of the cross. So then, let's take a look at it this way. Let's look at three different things. We're going to be looking at the mocking of Jesus. We're going to be looking at his punishment. We're going to be looking at the fact that he was crucified, what, what his death had to do with us, and why he had to die. So the mocking of Jesus. Matthew 27, verses 27 through 31. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters and they gathered the whole battalion before him and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and twisting a, together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand and kneeling before him, they mocked him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to, to crucify him. And here's the problem. Anyone outside of a relationship with Christ doesn't really think that sin is bad or that it really exists. Because before I became a Christian, I, I didn't have a clue. I knew there were bad things that happened in the world, but I didn't get the concept of sin. But it's not a question of so much of if, if there's sin, if it exists, or if it's bad or whatnot. It's a statement in a lifestyle of I am not accountable to the person that I cannot see. So in other words, if I can't see God, sin is not really going to be, it's not going to make that much of a difference to me. I actually have to have the word preached to me. The Bible talks about that salvation comes through the preaching of the word and that faith comes by hearing that word. I need, it's, the Apostle Paul said, I did not know what sin was, but by the law of God, the, the law of God showed me my transgression. And so now that I can see a holy God who says, no, this is not the way I love you. Stop and turn around and come to me that you may live Amen. so that my law may be written on your heart. Weren't meant to play Xbox and hang out doing all kinds of frivolous stuff and watching the next sitcom and all the rest. You're meant to for so much more. Amen. Sure. Not to not to say I have to wake up at a certain time and do such and such thing throughout the day and then go to bed. And that's my life. And hopefully I make it to retirement. Hmm. This is not it. The cross says, no, there is hope. We might feel bad if we do something wrong, but we handle it in different ways by making light of it. Or sometimes we even confess our sin, or sometimes we hide our sins. Nobody can see. But no matter what the case is, when it comes to owning up to it before God, he's not even a player on the game board. We need to be able to see the cross of Christ. Here's the problem with that type of thinking that we can hide away our sins. The problem is, is that there's actually a person named Jesus Christ. He actually walked the earth. He actually performed miracles. He actually loved people. He actually spoke about money. He actually spoke about repentance and mercy and love and all the life issues. And he didn't do it for life improvement or sociological betterment, but he said it for the kingdom of God and because he loved us. And he actually rose from the dead and he was spotted by hundreds of people after he did it. Both secular, non-religious, and people that were followers of him. They all saw him and it was written down in the Bible and it was written down in secular records. He was there, he did it. And there are some secular records that will point to, no, he didn't. And there are some people that would say, no, he didn't. And if sin really isn't sin, 
and none of the reasons that he came here really matter. And it seems like Christ wasted his time to come and die for the sins of the world. If he really didn't do it, then he didn't do it. So why live for him if he didn't actually do it? He didn't die on the cross. But John 3 says that he came to seek and save that which was lost. He came to seek me. We as humans think that sin really isn't a big deal. And we constantly feed ourselves the lie. I'll tell you how this works, too. I'll show you how it works. Can we get the Orson Welles on there? You remember Orson Welles from way back in the day? Mm -hmm. Way back in the day, he did this radio pro uh, show of uh, War of the Worlds. Yep. And so he's sitting there doing this fake newscast. Fake news. There it is, fake news. I mean, <laughs> Dull the thunder, there it is. Because that's exactly it. We're all familiar with fake news. And this guy, could we say that he may have started fake news? <laughs> or so here, for the those that are younger, book about War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. Well, Orson Wells, he was voice of gold and silk and all the rest, and he's sitting there on a radio program one night <clears throat> to all the United States, broadcasting out, and he does this amazing story about the war of the worlds and people are listening to it and they didn't have the internet and they didn't have social media so we can't check facts we can't do snopes and we're sitting there listening to it we have our ears glued to the box and we're sitting there looking at it and we're 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 hanging on every word that orson wells is saying and he's saying this martians are coming to earth and they're here right now and they just landed and they're killing people and we'll be back in a few minutes after a word from our sponsor. What? The, what are you talking about? People are dying by ray guns and blasts. What are you talking about? We were getting into the whole thing of feeding ourselves a lie. And we believed it. Or you can do this one. I actually got pulled on this one. Can we bring up Juji the dog? I don't know if you're familiar with this, but I watched a video on this guy. This man owns Juji the dog, but from the appearance of it, the dog is like seven feet tall. Looks like Juji owns him. But this whole video is all about about how an amazing dog, what an amazing dog this dog is. He's an amazing animal. And there was something wrong with him, medically speaking. And he started out as a little puppy, and then he grew up, and he grew up, and he grew up. And lo and behold, he's seven feet tall yet. And boy, what a struggle it is. But how we laugh, how we cry together, and boy, the dog and the owner and everything like that. Well, it's sitting there feeding me this live via this video. And by the time the end of the, end of the video, I'm thinking, wow, okay, well, I'm open to the realm of possibility that we got a seven-foot dog walking around. And I finally did some fact checking and it turns out it's false. <laughs> I was so disappointed because I'm such a dog lover. We got two dogs, we got little wiener dogs. Now what would I want with a big old dog named Juju? I don't know, but wouldn't it be awesome? But all these different stories, War of the Worlds, Juju the dog, they fake everybody out. We do the same thing with sin, don't we? We do. We, we fake ourselves out. And yet, whether we know it or not, we're still held accountable by God. Here's a popular phrase. I made Jesus the Lord of my life. No, you did not. He was already Lord of your life. Whether you acknowledged him or not, That's right. he is still sovereign king of the universe and everything that lies outside and within it. He is master of all that he surveys. And he surveys everything. So if there's no need to be held accountable by God whom you can't see, then there's no need to acknowledge that you sin. And if there's no need to acknowledge that you sin, then there's no need for forgiveness. And if there's no need for a transcendent forgiveness of sin, meaning above and beyond forgiveness. In other words, forgiveness from God. If there's no need for forgiveness from God, then there's no need to believe in an archaic book like the Bible. And so since then, there's no need to attend a church service, 
which preaches the gospel, and certainly there's no need to acknowledge God because he does not exist. Which, if this is the mindset of Western culture, which it is by and large, a lot of people believe in atheism. If this is the mindset of the United States, if this is the mindset of Canton, Ohio, if this is the mindset of Carrollton, in Carroll County, if this is the mindset of Delroy, if this is the mindset of the places that you shop and go to work and go to school, then you certainly don't need any forgiveness. If you can't see God, then there's no accountability. And this is how we rationalize our sin. He is not here, he's not looking, and no, he is not Lord over the universe, and he certainly didn't die on a cross. So just like those people back in the day, just like they mocked him and they spat upon him, they didn't recognize him as Lord, even though he was Lord and King, we mock him with getting away with our sin or thinking that we do. And this is our mistake. This is why the cross doesn't mean too much. But we gather here every Sunday to worship our king, and rightfully so. Do we gather in our hearts on Monday morning before a loving, righteous God? Do we acknowledge the cross on Thursday afternoon? Then we find that Jesus took our punishment Verse 32 through 44, as they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head, they put a charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right side and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests and with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, he saved others. He can't even save himself. He's a king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God, but God will deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. And it's at this point, when he gets crucified, that we see that God, Jesus Christ, took the punishment that we should have. Jesus takes the pain. And we, what do we do? We try to run, and we run, and maybe we don't run physically, but we run mentally. Even in the mental exercise of, of running from our sin is just for a millisecond, but we run from our sin. We won't acknowledge it. We won't let the cross do its work, and this is how we run. We, we default by going back to getting our fix, whatever that fix is. Don't look down on the drug addicts or the alcoholics. Everybody is an addict in one way or another. We're an addict to sin. So because we're sinners, we are cosmic addicts. We're immortal beings that need a fix, and we're all different. So we all have our different choice of drug. So when we get stressed out, when we get bored, when we get selfish, we default to getting our fix, i.e. we sin. We, as the Bible says, we fall short of the glory of God. And we become satisfied with our own glory. That's what we want. We want that satisfaction. We want to be held. We want, to, we want to know that we're adored. So if we don't feel it, we'll go out and get it for ourselves. We'll default to that sin. We won't go to the cross. 
That's what it's all about. If we won't give glory to a higher being, i.e. God, then we'll give it to ourselves because we were built to worship. And we must worship someone or something. And every time we do, we sear our consciences with the hot iron of sin and we dull the pain. The pain of knowing that we grow farther and farther and farther away from our created who desperately longs to have a relationship with us. Do you hear me, men? Men, do you hear me? I've heard over and over from several different people, several different sources, all in this one week. Where are the men? Go to the cross. Go to the cross. I turn to Romans 118. You don't have to turn there. I don't have time for this cross thing. I don't. It's foolishness to me. I don't understand this living for Jesus every day. I can click my card on Sunday. Besides that, where's Jesus in my life? The Bible says in 118 of Romans, it says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven, heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness they suppress the truth. They push it down. We push it down. We push it down. We know what truth is and we push it down. We have the knowledge of God in our heads. But we push it down. We suppress it. And with every default switch that's flipped, with every cosmic treason that's committed, with every fix that's shot into our spiritual veins that we get a high from, every sin that we commit in reality, we gave the fuel that power to hammer, to drive the nails into the sinless Son of God. It's exactly what we do. And when we do this, we sear our consciousness. 1 Timothy 4.2. And we do this against someone who never committed one sin. Not one. We sin, but Jesus, in Isaiah 53, speaking five, about 500 years beforehand, says this, that who has believed what he has heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form of man, majesty that we should even look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces, and he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that is before him, before his shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. Hmm. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. And out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many. He makes intercession for the transgressors. I said earlier that we want satisfaction 
And the only time we seem to feel like we get it is when we sin, when we default to that fix. And yet, verse 11 out of Isaiah 53 says, Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. He is satisfied to save. He is satisfied to make you righteous. He is satisfied to love you. He is satisfied to wrap his arms in a way to wrap around you. He is satisfied like an eagle with giant wings to come to your aid and swallow you up and say, I am here for you. I love you. I love you. Come and run to my cross. Be under conviction of sin and get it right and repent because I love you. Here is the cross. Jesus takes what we should have. And further than that, he dies. Jesus dies. He took on the wrath of the Father. Matthew 27, 45 through 56, it says, Now from the sixth hour there was darkness all over the land until the ninth hour. In about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, when thou is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing him said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge and filled it with sour wine. And he put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. Still mocking. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split, and the tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep, who had died, were raised, and coming up out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went to the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly, this is the Son of God. There were also many women there looking on from a distance who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. You see, Psalm 711 says, God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation every day. Our God feels indignation every day because he sees the sins that we that everybody on earth commits. And that just wrath for sin, it must come out. It must. And this is how gracious God is. God released his wrath out on his own son, Jesus, for sin. The Bible says that Jesus became sin for us. And it says here, it says here in verse 45 that there was darkness all over the land. And at about the ninth hour, verse 46, Jesus cried out, why have you forsaken me? But there was darkness over the land. During that darkness, God poured out his wrath on the sinless son of God. Yeah. And I don't know about you, but I would rather take my wrath towards Jesus. Say, please, take it, take it, take it. I can't take it. I'm not worthy to take it. You, you take it, please. I would rather say I'm going to the cross. Everybody's level at the foot of the cross. Nobody is more righteous than the other person. No matter what your background is, and I feel compelled to say no matter what your religious background is, when you come to Christ, and you come to this level cross, and you confess your sin and cry out to God for forgiveness and repent and turn towards him. He will forgive you. Verse Timothy 1.15 says, this saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of who I am the foremost. First John 4, 9 through 10 in this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. He 
He was right there to take our place. And so at the last, Jesus died so that, Jesus died so that, 2 Corinthians 5.21, for our sake, he, God, made him, Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. There is a holy, sacred transaction that happens when I come to Christ as a wicked sinner he forgives me, and the righteousness that I thought I had was really sin. And he says, here is my righteousness. I give it to you. I drape you. I clothe you with my righteousness. Mm. You see, here's what happens in Philippians 2.8. And being found in human form, Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That is why we can be obedient in our Christian lives, because he was obedient on a cross. That's motivation. Amen? Yeah. Galatians 3.13 says this, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Verse 14, so that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, you and me, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. He has everything to give us. We have everything to gain and nothing to lose except our sin. And Hebrews 9.22 says, Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. When Jesus' body was made hamburger meat, and there is blood flowing, I trust in the blood of Christ to redeem me from all sin. Romans 6.6 6 says, We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. You don't have to be a slave to sin. Talked about it in men's group today. We can be a bondservant, a slave to God. And what a glorious existence that is to be God's slave. Because he loves us. He cares for us out of that love, that mercy, and that compassion. And we're connected to him. Ladies and gentlemen, beloved, we can live a life of freedom in Christ. Mm -hmm. Galatians 2.20 says this. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And this message is for those who don't have a relationship with Jesus. This message is for me, who has a relationship with Jesus, but I could certainly do to value that relationship so much more. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, I will forever keep trying to pay a debt that I can never repay. And it will be my joy to do it because of who Jesus is. If there is, and I'm going to be very honest with you, if there is a sin, look, please look at me closely. Do not check out. If there is a sin in your life that you are trying desperately to get rid of, God understands. If you know him, you know that you're a child of God and there is a sin or sins that you are trying to desperately get rid of. Come to the altar today. Find the love and forgiveness. Maybe it's a spirit of gossip, an attitude of gossip. Maybe it's a thing of, what well, I don't know. I don't know what it could be. Lying. Maybe it's the sin of idolatry. You have some idols in your life. You trust more than you trust God. Whatever it may be, come to the altar and get it right with God and leave it there. Come to the cross. Come to Jesus. And if those of you who have never had a relationship with Christ or you fooled yourself into thinking that you have, but you have no fruit whatsoever that says, 
if I was to be put in a court of law right now and judged as a Christian or not, I would not be judged as a Christian. If that is you, come to the cross. Let him love you. Let him take you in. Respond. The day of living the normal American Christian life, it's done. It's, it's got to be done. It's, we, the American church has to move past this. It has to move past it. I speak from coast to coast. I am hoping for a spiritual revival, but beloved, if we do not come to the cross, revival will never happen. Mm -hmm. Please rise. Elders, please come. This